Today we're in chapter 4 of Romans. We continue our study in Romans by looking at verses 13 through 25. So let's begin reading together at verse 13. I'll read verses 13 through 15 and we'll get into our study. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Paul writes, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So Paul is continuing his uh, teaching, as we already have noted in chapter 4, concerning a subject called justification. And he's been speaking concerning the contrast of faith and the law of Moses. Here he's going to introduce a contrast between the law of Moses and a promise, a promise that was given to the Jewish forefather, a man by the name of Abraham. And uh, he's pointing out that Abraham did not practice the law of Moses because Abraham actually predated the law of Moses by several centuries. And because of this, uh, the receiving of God's promise came through faith in God and not the law. Now, in verse 13, when he says, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world, when he speaks concerning this promise, all you need to do is get into your Old Testament, look in the book of Genesis, and you begin to see this promise that is being alluded to here in chapter 4, verse 13. And that promise, interestingly enough, that is given to Abram has what we would call four stages. In other words, it's one promise, but it has four elements that are involved in it. Because when God began to speak to Abram there in Genesis chapter 12, he began in a general sense to say to him that he would be a blessing to all people through his descendants. Later on, he, he expands that in chapter 13, verse 16, and he says he will have a people as numerous as the dust on the ground, and then... In chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, he expands it to say that he's also going to give him land. And then finally, in chapter 22, he says that there will be a Redeemer who comes from him, whom we know to be the Messiah. So this promise that God gave was a promise that is to be received not by his works, but by his faith. The Bible teaches us very clearly that nobody can keep the whole law perfectly, so keeping the law for salvation would require perfection. If there's anybody in this room, in other words, who thinks that in order for you to go to heaven, you have to become a perfect person, then there's no hope for you at all. Because nobody on the face of the earth is capable of following all the rules and regulations God has given. None of us can do that perfectly. And it requires perfection. And uh, if you're not perfect, then you're going to fail, and thus judgment will fall upon you. The law demands perfect obedience. Galatians chapter 3, verse 12 says it. The law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. And so, as uh, Paul is writing here, he's making it very clear that no one can keep the law perfectly, and no one can be saved by following Moses' commandments alone. That's why we need grace. And that is why we exercise faith in a merciful and a forgiving and a loving God. That's why we do that. So righteousness doesn't result from obedience to the law alone. In uh, Galatians, when Paul was writing uh, to the Galatians, he had made that very clear. He said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, Christ has died in vain. And so Paul was pointing out that righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ, through recognition that we have been crucified with him. And so by trying to keep the commands of Moses, Paul is making it very clear here, you're not going to be able to do that because nobody's perfect. There's only been one who was able to do that perfectly, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. So in our failure to keep the law of Moses, there's only one thing that we can expect to happen, if we think we become righteous through following the law, and that is judgment. He says in verse 15, the law brings about wrath. And so the only thing a person can expect is judgment, because the law doesn't save, 
What it really does is it reveals our sinfulness and directs us to the Savior. So the more one tries to keep it, the more guilty they become because they cannot keep it. And because no one can keep the law, no one can do the righteous things that are necessary to obtain heaven through their works, well, the result, he's saying, is to suffer the wrath of God. And the way that you suffer that is when you stand before God and he brings judgment upon your life. So he's developing the necessity of salvation by grace through faith. That's what he's sharing. He's making it clear to his readers that if you try to become right before God through efforts of your own or to try and keep a religious ritual of some sort, it is not going to happen. You're only going to fail because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no way that's going to happen. And because no one can keep it perfectly, the result is suffering the wrath of God in judgment. Now, Paul's already made it clear that God reserves his wrath for those who reject him. He had said that in chapter 1, verse 18. But that's not a unique feature of the book of Romans because he says something similar in Ephesians 5. When you look at Ephesians 5, verses 5 through 7, and this is the amplified uh, version, uh, Ephesians 5, 5 through 7 says, uh, For be sure of this, that no person practicing sexual vice or impurity in thought or in life, or one who is covetous, who has lustful desire for the property of others and is greedy for gain, for he, in effect, is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one delude and deceive you with empty excuses and groundless arguments for these sins, for though these things the for through these things the wrath of God comes upon sons of rebellion and disobedience. So do not associate or be sharers with them. So God's wrath is reserved for those who reject him and ultimately all stand before God in judgment if they don't receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And so he's making it very, very clear that we need the Lord. It's not the works that we do. It's casting our cares on him. It's not our trying so hard and going through all the rituals that, that we can go through. It's through learning to trust him and have faith in him. When he says in verse 15, for where there is no law, there is no transgression, he's simply pointing out that when God made his promise to Abraham, the law of Moses was still in the future. So salvation is really something that is according to the undeserved favor of God called grace. Salvation is received on the basis of God's grace through faith, it's not on the basis of human effort or simply a strong belief that there's a God. It's through the grace of God. You can try as hard as you want, do the best that you can, but you will always fall short of the glory of God. That's the bottom line, and we all know that. None of us is perfect. None of us is absolutely righteous in and of ourselves. And no matter how hard we try, we're still going to fail because none of us can perfectly fulfill the requirements of God. That's why Jesus was the only one who could ever do something like that. So we are saved through the provision of grace through faith. In Ephesians 2.8, it says, For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so grace and faith working together. God gives to us the ability to have salvation and a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Some of us in this room don't understand how much God loves them. I want to spend just a moment just reminding you of that before we continue on in this passage. Some of us need to be reminded that the Lord loves you. See, a lot of people don't understand that, and I think this generation especially has lost sight of that. I was speaking to somebody uh, recently who was um, basically were emailing one another and was sharing with me that he's from a generation of, of young people that don't really understand what it means to be loved by God. And he shared with me, a lot of the reason is because they had distant parents or, or non-existent relationships because the dad left the family or never was part of it in the first place. And so when somebody like me stands up and speaks concerning love and God's grace and goodness, he was saying it's difficult for his generation, for his friends and him to really fully understand because he said we really don't have the uh, backdrop by which to view those comments. We really don't understand that. And, one of the th and he asked, how, how is it that you come to, to know that God loves you? How, how do you know that? How do you know that there is a God who loves you? How does that happen? 
I, I honestly can't speak to that for every person, but I can give a little testimony concerning that in my own life because in the generation that I came from, my father was typical of his own generation, which was basically the mentality that men don't show emotion and men don't show affection. Emotion and affection are really things that women can do, but men just provide income so that they can have food on the table and clothes on the back of the children. And so my dad was one of those typical fellows of his generation who didn't really know how to show affection. For my dad, for me to have affection from him was if I walked by him, he'd hit me in the back of the head. And I knew that, that oh, my dad loves me. Wham, you know, I said, oh, well, he really loves me. He hit me twice, <laughs> you know. But that was pretty much it. If I wanted to talk to my father, I would walk into the den and uh, I'd wait to talk to him in between commercials because in the program during the commercials, the commercials would be a minute or two or three minutes. And if I had anything to say to my dad, I would sit there while he was watching his TV program. And then when the commercial came on, then I would speak to him and I would ask him things and share with him and then it would end. And that was pretty much it. You know, growing up, my father taught me in a very early age, I think it might have been about four years of age or so, my dad told me that, um, you know, uh, men don't, don't kiss because they used to kiss my father goodnight. I still remember him holding me back when I was going to give him a kiss goodnight. And he said, men don't kiss, men shake hands. And that was how my father was and that's how I was raised. I didn't hear my father use the words, I love you, until I was 17 years old. My dad just didn't use those words. He didn't say them to me until I was 17. And the reason he even brought those words up to me at 17 was because I was in a lot of trouble. And um, I had gotten really mad and, at my father. And, uh, and he grabbed me and he held on to me and he wept on my shoulder. And he said to me, son, I love you. And that was the first time I'd ever hear my father say, I love you, that I can remember. So I didn't know anything about affection. I didn't know how to express affection. I didn't know anything about conversation. I didn't know anything about love. And it wasn't that I felt like neglected because I didn't. I knew my dad loved me because he put food on the table and clothes on my back because he was faithful to my mom. He never used those words, and I knew my dad felt those things. He just couldn't bring himself to say those things. But what happened is that was pretty much put into my life. And so with that, one, I don't know how to love. And then two, when I was about six years old, my mom was hospitalized, and she had been hospitalized more than once. And so I was in my room at around six years of age, and when, when it has hit me, how many times is my mom going to be away? She's in the hospital so often. That as a little guy, I started to cry. And as I was crying, my father walks into the room and he asks me, and my dad used to talk really roughly, so he'd say, what are you crying about? And I said, um, you know, um, mama's, I'm, I'm crying because I miss my mom. My mama's not here. And my dad, God bless my father, he didn't, he didn't mean anything by this, but my father says to me, well, if you're good, your mother won't get sick. So at the age of six, I start trying to be perfect. So I know what I'm talking about when I'm saying that trying hard doesn't work because I tried. So I thought if I am a good little boy, I'm six years old, if I'm a good little boy, mama will not go to the hospital anymore. And so for years I tried, for years. I became a model kid. You know, I had my moments, you know, as all kids do, but... I became a model kid, you know, I was the polite kid, the, 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 just the nice kid, I was, I was that, you know, and I tried hard, I got my first communion, I went on to my confirmation, I did the religious thing, I did my best to be good, I avoided things that were wrong, tried to be a you know, good student, good athlete, the, the whole nine yards. By the time I was 15, I, got, I just said, I can't do it, my mom was still sick, my mom was still having seizures and the various things that my mom had and my mom had been ill since I was four years old so that was my background how do you know God loves you when you don't have a father who will show affection when your father is so busy working two jobs to pay hospital bills that he never has time for you how do you know that see so at, at 15 that's when I got into alcohol at 16 that's when I got into drugs and that's when I gave myself completely over to that because I was saying at that point in my life, I've tried so hard and it's to no effect, so I'll just go in the opposite direction. And it wasn't like a decision, it was more of a release. And I just started doing what my nature wanted to do all along. I just stopped fighting it. And then I have people telling me about God. God loves you, God cares about you, God can change you, God can be there for you. But the only thing that I can think of is that that's probably true for you, but it hasn't been true for me. I don't understand that. 
I don't know what love is. And then finally, through the preaching of the message of the gospel, I began to hear things about God so loving the world and, and that God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I began to read that and I began to hear that message. And finally, I get saved. And as I'm saved, I, I'm beginning to wonder, okay, if God is really a God of love and a God of grace and God of compassion, and then, and then how do I know how to express those things to others? Because for me, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to say to someone, I love you. Marie and I were married for some time before I could bring myself to actually say, I love you. I didn't do that. I was like a lot of men. I, if she said, baby, say you love me, which Marie would do on occasion as, as young marrieds, I'd say, why? <laughs> why? Why? Now, I still remember I'm, I'm at, on the job site and I, I used to work behind a desk and I get a phone call and Marie's talking to me and we haven't been married more than a few months and, and she's saying to me, okay, honey, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. I said, okay, bye. She says, I love you. I said, yeah. And she says, she goes, uh, yeah, me too. And she goes, say it. I said, so what? She said, you loved me. I said, you know I do. Why would I do that? She goes, say it or I won't hang up. Some of you ladies know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm saying, no, no. And my boss, who had been married 20, 30 years at that time, turns to me and he says, just tell her you love her. She'll never hang up. He had some experience. So I didn't do that. And that's the whole point I'm trying to make. I did not do that. I, I did not know how to do that. I didn't know how to show emotion. The only emotion that was legitimate to ever show was anger. If you're angry, it's okay to be angry. I was one of these guys who was drunk. I would show affection when I was drinking. When I was drinking, it's okay. So I'd look at the girl and say, baby, I love you, man. I really love you. You know, I really love you, you know, because it's okay to do that. Because later on, I'll say, man, I was drunk. <laughs> that's why I said that. And so that's just the truth, and that's how it was for me. A lot of you understand what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to make a point. I'll get to it in a moment. How, how do you love? How's that happen? Well, I read the Bible. I got saved. I started reading the Bible. Didn't happen overnight. Didn't happen in a week. Didn't happen in a month. Didn't happen in a year, and it didn't happen in two or three years. It took years because as I was reading the Bible, certain things began to stand out. Certain things like Jesus would hold children in his arms. My culture doesn't do that. Women take care of the babies. Men go in the other room and talk and watch the game. But the kids in your arm, are you kidding me? That's a woman's work. That's how I was raised. That's what I thought. That's what I believed. To hold children, no. To say you love them, never. Why would I do that? You know, if I put food on the table, if I put clothes on their back, if I'm there for their mother, they ought to know that. Why will I have to communicate? But I'm reading the Bible, and there's Jesus holding children, blessing them. And I say to myself, well, he was a man's man. This was a carpenter. He had strong back. You know, he didn't go to Bethlehem Lumber to get some wood to make a table. He went out and cut it down himself. And he did all the work himself. And not only was he, uh, was he a, a man who was a carpenter, he was also an expert stonemason. So he'd go out to the quarry and he would get his own stone and he'd come and chisel it. His hands were calloused. His back was, was rippled with muscle. He was a strong man because that's how he was. And I began to research and I began to see that. And I'm thinking this powerful man was still a gentle man with babies. So this is before the Lord. I'm telling you how I changed so I start saying, a man can hold a child. Then I see that Jesus loved other guys. Me? Yeah, how you doing? We hit each other. We throw an elbow on one another. We push their face. I mean, we're loving them. That's how my dad loved me. He'd hit me in the back of the head. So I'm figuring that's what men do, and that's how guys are. So we do that. But I'm reading the Bible, and there's a man named John who refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved, and I see John. You see, when we'd have prayer meetings, uh, the guys wanted to hold my hand. You don't hold my hand, man. 
So when they say, no, we hold hands when we pray. I'd say, why? Because we're brothers. I say, yeah. So I would squeeze their hands really tight. I really would. They're not going to get any weird thoughts about this man. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm not making this up. I would. If it was a woman, it was different. It was a man. They got the death grip. But I'm reading about John putting his head on the chest of Jesus. I don't get that at all. At all. Thing in different culture. And then he's saying, I'm the one who Jesus loved. And I almost hear it in that sing song, Jesus loved me, that kind of thing. And I just, I'm just, it's, that's not male. That's not appealing. But I'm reading it and I'm thinking, maybe it's okay to actually love guys in a wholesome way. I guess it's okay. Jesus did, right? Then I see him at the tomb of a friend. Who died and what's the Bible say Jesus wept I had friends who died one of my friends got shot in the head another one of my friends drove his motorcycle in the back of a parked pickup truck another one of my friends overdosed in his house and others who had died and I went to the funerals my friend Bobby got stabbed to death at a tasty freeze in Santa Fe Springs Friends, and we're 18, we're 19, we're 20 years old, the, we're 16 even, and, and they're getting killed. And I go to the funerals, and I sit there like the other guys, and just, he's dead, that's all there is to it. Then I'm looking at Jesus, and Jesus is weeping over a friend, and I say, it's okay for a man to cry if God himself has tears. I can too. My dad only cried in my sight as I grew up one time that I remembered. And that's when he had to go and have an operation. And he was already a believer. And he held me so tight in his arms as I prayed for him, he wept. He had wept once before, I correct myself, when I was 17, when he had told me for the first time that he loved me. And he wept on my shoulder as he held me in his arms. And he said, son, I love you. The first time he wept and said, I love you, I wanted to push him away because I didn't like that at all. Leave me alone. The next time he did that, I held him tightly because he's my dad and he was going to have an operation and I was concerned for him and I'd become a Christian. And I was reading this book here. How do you know that God loves you? How do you know? I had friends who loved Jesus who began to love me not for what they could get from me, not some bargain, some deal. In my circle of friends, I have a car, you have drugs, I'll give you a ride if you give me some drugs. That's how it works. I've got this, you've got that, we can barter, and that's pretty much it. In terms of friendship and all, that doesn't go very deep. But you get saved, and now you have people who love you just for love's sake, who will put their arm around your shoulder and say, you know what, I love you, man. You're my brother in the Lord, and I'm just not getting it. It took years for me, and it came through fellowship with believers in Jesus Christ who lived the love of Christ in front of me. So I had a model, and it came through spending time in the Word of God. And as I read the Word of God, I see that it's not my works, there's not a single thing that I could do that would ever make God love me more. Because before I was even born, Jesus already had died. He had already demonstrated his love for me. He already gave his life up for me. And what it took on my part is what Paul is speaking about. It took an awareness that I could never earn the love that he already gave with my works. But what he wants me to do is receive by faith that which he offers me, which is salvation. And that's what Paul is teaching us here. He's teaching us about having a relationship with God that is not based on your good works, but on a work that has already been performed. God has already given his son. Notice in verse 16, therefore, he says, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. 
so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he might become the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so God has always saved people on the basis of his grace through faith exercised in him. You have faith that you give to the Lord, and that's how you're saved. Hebrews eleven six says, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, the Bible, as mentioned before, uh, reveals that Abraham was recognized as a righteous man before the law was given. In Genesis 15, 6, it simply says he believed in the Lord and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. And so he received a right standing before there were Jews and before there were even Gentiles. He's the father of the Jewish nation and he's already receiving this promise and he's already standing right before God. And so the promise is sure. And the promise that was made isn't simply to the Jewish nation. It's a promise that's made to the Jew as well as the Gentile. And so in Christ, now that we've received Christ, it doesn't matter what my ethnic heritage is. It doesn't matter where my land of origin may be or my ancestry. That doesn't matter. What matters is Jesus Christ who unites us and makes us one. And that's how we enter into relationship with God. It's through faith. And that's how we receive eternal life. In verse 17, when he says, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom, whom he believed. God had made this promise to him while Abraham was there. And then he begins to reveal the God that Abraham worshipped. Notice how it says in verse 17 that this God Abraham worshipped gives life to the dead. Now that was demonstrated when Abraham and Sarah were gifted with their son Isaac. He calls into being that which does not exist because he's the God of creation. Makes it very clear that Abraham was beyond the age of creating life, but God gave life to Sarah's womb. That I find very interesting because in eight, verses 18 through 20, he speaks concerning that. And I'll read it again and then share a little bit. He said, contrary to hope and hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Think about it. The man's almost 100 years old. And he's looking at a 90-year-old woman. I don't even want to think about it. I shouldn't have told you to think about it. That's not something you want to think about. <laughs> I don't know. But I, <laughs> I know that Picasso is around 92 and had a child. I've told Marie, should she go home, I'll still have kids later on. She doesn't like that. I think her one requirement is I marry a 90-year-old woman. But I can, I can see the, the human possibility, if you will, though, and I'll show you this in a moment, Scripture speaks that he was as good as dead. But he didn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. She's a 90-year-old woman. I don't think I have any 90-year-old women in here. But if I do, how would you like to go to the doctor and find out you're pregnant? I don't think so. 
I'm what? You're with child. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm, yes, you are. Think about that. 90 years old. And that's why when the Lord said to Abram that this time next year, Sarah will be with child, that's why Sarah listening in that tent laughed within herself and said, shall I at this age have pleasure? The pleasure of having a child at 90? No way. And that's why God says, to Abram, why did Sarah laugh? And then Sarah says, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did laugh. I heard you laugh. And you'll see this. And by the way, the child that you're going to give birth to is going to be named Isaac. Laughter. So whenever you call him, you'll remember that I'm good to my word, that the promises I give will be fulfilled. And that's the God that we serve. The miraculous reality of that doesn't escape me. I'm amazed that this took place in the way that God said it would. But then again, why wouldn't it? God's word is always true. Let God be true and every man a liar, as Paul's already said. God's word is always true. And that's another one of the things that people have problems with, and that is simply just grabbing hold of the word of God and trusting it. God has tremendous, remarkable, precious promises for those whom he loves. Tremendous promises. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There are so many scriptures that God gives us promises in, that he will transform us, that we can become new creations. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Promises and, 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 and words of encouragement. I have loved you with an everlasting love. God's mercies are renewed every morning. There are so many, many promises that God has given to his children that we just don't even, even receive. God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he not said it? Will he not do it? And so that's part of the problem that people have today in their walks with the Lord because they think, well, God says these things perhaps, but it only is true for others and it's never true for me. I used to believe this. I used to believe that God loves the world. I'm part of the world, but he loves other people more than he loves me. I could pray for somebody else because I believed that God would answer the prayer for them, but I would not pray for myself because I did not expect him to answer it for me because in the back of my mind, there was a sense that God really doesn't care about David. And it took an awful long time for God to work in my life through his word, by his spirit, through my friends, through teachings for me to finally get to that point where I could say to the Lord, I know you love me, and I know your word is good to me, and I know your plans are good for me. I believe that. And I believe that you will never leave me, nor will you ever forsake me. I believe that I am sealed with your spirit into the day of redemption. I, I believe that I have received power from on high. I began to finally just take God's word and apply it which is, again, where a lot of us in this room fail in our walks. Because one, we may not even know his promises, and two, when we hear them, we're kind of like thinking, these things are much too big for me. Can these things truly be true? And God would be saying to us, why would I lie to you? We need to just begin to receive what God has for us. And what God has for us is grace, and mercy, and he gives us exceeding great and precious promises. The, the Bible says in verse 21, he was fully convinced that what he had promised, he's also able to perform, and that's what made him a righteous man. It says in verse 22, it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Because his righteousness came not by his works, that's the point he's making. Now, verse 23, it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So these words and promises apply to us too. The same principles that Abraham learned apply to us. 
And we need this story because we are saved in the same manner that Abraham was. It wasn't written for his sake alone, as he says. It was imputed to him, but it's also for us. Scripture is to apply to us and encourage us. Romans 15, verse 4, whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. It was for us. It says in verse 24, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus. The same principles again apply to us. We believe in the one who raised Jesus from the dead. He raised Jesus, he'll raise us up too. Verse 25 says he was delivered up because of our offenses, was raised because of our justification. He is the one who suffered the sentence of death for our sins and he served our sentence because death is the penalty for sin. But not only did he die, but the Bible makes it clear he was raised and he was raised, as he says, for our justification. So we are now declared righteous before God and we stand before him as those who are not guilty. His resurrection provides justification for us. So when I stand before the Lord, if I were to have to have a conversation concerning why he should allow me to enter into his heaven, which he doesn't have to ask me that, it's already a settled deal that took place on earth, but were he to say, why should I allow you in, the proper answer is, is because of what Jesus did for me. Not by works that I've attempted to perform on your behalf, not through things I've tried to do or religious rituals that were thrust upon me or that I voluntarily practiced. The reason that I'm allowed into the kingdom of God isn't because I tried so hard. Because I tried and I failed. And it's not because I made myself better even after getting saved. I worked so hard and so diligently to become holy. It's not that either. The reason why I'm allowed into the kingdom is because my Savior Jesus paid the price for me to enter in. And I, by, by faith, received that, that promise. I took him at his word. I asked him to forgive me, a sinner. I asked him to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I told him, I want to be born again. I want to have a new life. And I confess to him, I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness, and only you can wash and cleanse me. Forgive me, a sinner. And I took him at his word. I didn't go out and say, I've been baptized. I didn't say, I received my first communion. I didn't say, I received my confirmation. I didn't say anything like that. What I did say is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me. God, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. I believe that he was buried, and the third day he rose from the dead. I believe he lives and ever lives to make intercession for me. I believe he is my Savior, and I believe that in him I can have eternal life. And that's how I got saved, and that's how you get saved. Not by the works, not by trying, not by doing your best, but by believing, by receiving, by exercising your will to say yes to a promise that God gave to you, by hating your sin and wanting to be right with God, which is called conviction, and saying, God, I need a new life because this old one is just not worth living anymore. I need a new life. And God says, I'll give you that. And when he gives you that, then your life begins to change because you read the word, because you're in fellowship with other believers, and you begin to practice that which God is teaching you. And then a year or two or three or four or five years down the line, people begin to say, see the amazing changes that have taken place in your life so that this person like myself who didn't know how to say, I love you, can now do that very easily. A person like myself who never held a child in my arm, the first kids that I actually really held on to, that I really held on to, were my own. And now I can hold other people's babies and enjoy that because I love them. And a person like myself who didn't cry because men don't cry, find it very easy to allow myself to feel the feelings that I actually do have and not to feel like I'm not a man because I show emotion. 
That all came from Jesus Christ. They didn't come from the world. The world taught me to be the opposite, but Jesus taught me to be what I am, and I get that from the Word of God, and so can you.